Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome and welcome back to our immunology lectures on so uh, we have been talking about uh, the cytokines their effects and in the different uh, immune systems so uh, we have kind of learned what the cytokines can do what the cytokines how they work and all these things uh, we have also got a uh, very clear idea about uh, um, the complement system the complement activation and everything so we will move on to our next topic today and uh, that is on hypersensitivity so the immune system when there is a foreign invasion when there is a foreign pathogen attacking the immune our body or when there is a foreign invasion we normally have immune response there is a immune response the cells of the immune system they immediately infiltrate that area they go to that area and start to produce a response but sometimes in response to certain uh, environmental immunogens or antigens there can also be a hyper response that is uh, increased response it's it's often called uh, is a need to uh, i mean uh, it's kind of a very uh, hyperactive response from the immune system and it's also kind of uh, it probably the immune system doesn't need to respond in that way and it's a, it's a um, pseudo response you can say also so and there are specialized uh, cells in the immune system uh, which sometimes uh, does this kind of elicits this kind of response and this kind of uh, hyper response to any um, any kind of um, foreign invasion we refer to it as hyper sensitivity that means the immune system has uh, shown a hyper sensitive uh, attitude towards that foreign antigen and uh, it is also a kind of an inappropriate we can also sometimes it is described as an inappropriate immune response so it's not the appropriate immune response that should have developed for example uh, we face it very often uh, like a response to um, we can have response to dust for example some people have allergy for dust some people have allergy for the pollens uh, and there can be many other ways of uh, this kind of inappropriate immune responses and this all together can be taken into consideration and sometimes they are known as hypersensitivity so we call it the the overall response together we call it the hypersensitivity reaction now this hypersensitivity reactions can occur in many ways so there can be different types of immune responses uh, which uh, there are different types of this kind of hyper responses from the immune system or inappropriate re responses from the immune system uh, when it comes in contact with immunogens or um, antigens uh, particularly allergens we sometimes also call them as allergens and that can lead to a hypersensitivity reaction and the main uh, manifestation of this kind of reaction is you will uh, start having an inflammation so the major uh, immune uh, effector pathway is an inflammatory pathway so there is inflammation and you can have uh, histamine release release of histamine and other inflammatory uh, vasoactive amines which leads to or enhances this inflammation and due to that you can have uh, swelling you can have local swelling local redness even you can have a systemic response and that can lead to fever and many things so for example a very very common uh, form of this hypersensitivity reaction is like allergic rhinitis we all have it we have uh, during uh, uh, during the change of the season when there is a pollens in the air 
and some people are very sensitive to these pollens and they can uh, develop this kind of hypersensitive reactions. And you can have a running nose, you can have cold, you can have fever and all these are immune response to that particular allergen and that depends on that particular person's immune system how he or she uh, responds to that kind of an allergen. So, this kind of uh, immune responses can actually be again uh, reclassified into at least four different types of hypersensitivity or four different ways the immune uh, system can respond to this kind of uh, uh, agents. And uh, one of the very commonest form of this response is the type 1 hypersensitivity. So, type 1 hypersensitivity primarily is mediated by IgE. So, it is an IgE mediated. So, all these hypersensitivity reactions let us uh, be. So, there are at least uh, hypersensitivity can actually be classified into at least four types. So, we have uh, type 1, then we have type 2, we have type 3, and type 4. So, all these hypersensitivity reactions type 1, 2, 3 or 4 whatever it is all of these hypersensitivity reactions they originate from they can either be um, uh, originating from the humoral branch of the immunity or from the cell mediated branch of the immunity. So, they are usually either antibody driven or uh, T cell driven. So, they are cell, uh, cell mediated. So, for example, uh, type 1 type 2 and type 3 these are mostly antibody driven. Type 1 is IgE driven it is mostly driven by IgE, type 2 IgG mediated and type 3 is antigen antibody complex mediated. So, it is formation of the antigen antibody complex. And type 4 is mostly cell mediated, so it is T cell mediated. So, these are the four different types of hypersensitivity reactions that can occur either it can be IgE mediated, IgG mediated or it can be a antigen antibody complex mediated or it can also be a T cell mediated immunity um, hypersensitivity. So, let us uh, look into what exactly occurs uh, in each of these uh, hypersensitive reactions and what kind of manifestations uh, they actually produce. So, um, let us first concentrate on the type 1, what is, what is the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction and how it occurs. So, moving on to the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. So, as I told that most of these allergies that we see allergy to pollen, allergy to dust, most of these allergy caused by the allergens that is the allergy causing agents they are mediated by the type 1 hypersensitivity and they are mediated by IgE in immunoglobulin E. Now of course then that means it involves the B cells. So then the initial uh, the, the initial part uh, of this hypersensitivity reaction is initiated by this dendritic cells and this dendritic cells as uh, we described that these dendritic cells are uh, one of the major connectors between the innate and the adaptive system. So, whenever there is an allergen coming in into our system, these dendritic cells they can actually process and present that allergen. So, they can present the allergen and that as an antigen. So, that antigen is presented to the CD4 plus cells that means the, uh, the, cell, the cells that develops into the T helper cells. So, they are presented by the MHC class 2 and are presented to this kind of CD4 plus cells. Now, this CD4 plus cells this specific CD4 plus cells they become the T helper cells primarily the it is a TH2 type response. So, they develop into those cells which develop into the TH2 cells why Th2? Now, there is a question why Th2? Why not Th1? Why not the other cells? So, because the Th2 
if you remember from our uh, cytokine uh, classes that all these subsets of the T cells or the T helper cells effector cells they produce different types of cytokines and the T helper cells are the major producer of the cytokines that can help in class switching of the B cells because you need to class switch the, the antibodies on the B cells. So, they will start now these B cells. So, these T helper cells they prime with the B cells which are expressing antibody on their surface. Now, these B cells they prime with this So, the Th2 type cells they prime with these B cells and they start to produce this interleukin 4. If you remember from our cytokine classes interleukin 4 is one of those major uh, cytokines that is required for class switching and this leads to class switching and that in turn actually helps these B cells to develop into either the plasma cells or the memory cells. Now, these plasma cells, these are the plasma cells. Now, these plasma cells, they will now start producing the antibodies and these plasma cells they now start to produce the IgE, the immunoglobulin E. And this IgE, why IgE? Now, this IgE, this IgE is the major mediator of the type 1 hypersensitivity. Now, how it mediates the type 1 hypersensitivity? Now, this IgE can now go and bind to so, the effector pathways are very much similar that we have learnt earlier as well. The effector pathways and the effector molecules, uh, they are very much similar. So, they are either uh, the vasoactive amines like the histamines or there are uh, lytic enzymes or complement activation. So, these are the effector pathways. So, in this case, these IgE molecules, they can go and bind to the surface receptors that are present on the mast cells or the basophils. So, now they can bind to a specific class of receptors that are known as the FC receptors and these FC receptors they are present on the surface of the mast cells or the basophils. So, these are the mast cells or the basophils. So, now and that leads to degranulation of the mast cells. Now, these mast cells which contains the granules and these granules are nothing but these granules are carrying uh, the histamines. So, the vasoactive amines and they will start to release the different vasoactive amines like histamine, leukotrienes and many other things. So, they will start to release histamine, prostaglandin and what do they do? These things they collectively what they do is they increases the vascular permeability or they lead to vasodilation. They can also lead to smooth muscle contraction. and then you will have enhancement of inflammation. So, there will be a enhanced inflammatory response and then you will start to have itching, you will start to have fever, you will start to have um, uh, 
cold, you can have cough, you can have cold, you can have um, redness and swelling, a local swelling, redness, all these things starts to occur. So, these things are primarily mediated by histamine and that is why if you now can connect these things, then that is why this uh, when people have this kind of type 1 hypersensitivity that can actually be treated and how? It can be treated by taking antihistaminic. So, a very simple way of doing it is by uh, having or by intake of antihistaminic. So, if you take antihistaminic uh, drugs, then you can actually deal with this kind of hypersensitivity. So, this histamine uh, receptors are then blocked and then uh, they do not this histamine uh, is, uh, cannot function and this kind of response cannot be elicited. Let us look into what exactly uh, the mechanism of this hypersensitivity reaction is, how this reaction is mediated. So, as we have learned that these uh, B cells, they, they are uh, primed and they are, uh, that there is a class switching and then they start producing the immunoglobulin E, the IgE and this IgE actually leads to, binds to the FC receptors on the mast cells and the basophils and that actually leads to the degranulation of these mast cells and the basophils leading to formation of uh, or release of histamine prostaglandin which actually leads to the vasodilation and the smooth muscle contraction. Now, what exactly happens on the surface of the cell are in, in, in these mast cells that leads to this degranulation process. So, the, that process is also sometimes referred to as a mast cell degranulation. So, let us consider this as a double layer um, bilayer lipid bilayer membrane and on this membrane we have this kind of receptor. So, this is a receptor uh, let us say an FC receptor and this FC receptor can bind to the antibodies. So, they can bind to the antibodies, the FC region of the antibodies and when there is the allergen is present, that allergen, when the allergen is present here, let us say this is the allergen and if this allergen is present, this allergen binds to the antibody. So, these are the IgE, these are the IgE, immunoglobulin E and this IgE can bind to the FC receptor. This is a specialized is receptor FC, epsilon R1 and these are also known as high affinity receptors. So, they have very high affinity for uh, this uh, antibodies, the IgE. So, these are the high affinity receptors and when they bind to this, this FC epsilon R1, they bind to this IgE that leads to cross-linking of the receptor. So, now the two receptors, they are cross-linked, they are together. So, this is a cross receptor cross-linking. So, there is cross-linking of the receptors. And these receptors are all of these receptors, they are associated with protein tyrosine kinase. And then this protein tyrosine kinase is activated and activation of the protein tyrosine kinase actually leads to phosphorylation of a component called the phospholipase C. this phospholipase C is then phosphorylated. Now, this phosphorylated phospholipase C has many functions. What it does is this phospholipase C can now convert the phosphoinositol bisphosphate to inositol triphosphate that is IP3 and diacylglycerol. I hope you know all these terms. Uh, if you have 
read uh, biochemistry and molecular biology, you have seen in cell biology, signal transduction, you have already uh, learned these terms uh, or you have uh, encountered these uh, uh, signaling pathways. There is conversion of the PIP2 that is the uh, phosphoinositol bisphosphate which is then converted to IP3 or inositol triphosphate and diacyl glycerol or DAG. Now, this DAG both of these components this IP3 and the DAG they perform separate functions. The IP3 is primarily required for the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. So, from the endoplasmic reticulum there is release of calcium and what this DAG does is it activates the protein kinase C. So, the protein kinase C which is normally inactive is now active PKC. Now, this is the active PKC. Now, the active PKC along with the calcium these together they are required for contraction of the microtubules. So, they are required for microtubule contraction process and this. So, now these granules, these granules are nothing but sacs containing uh, histamine and the vasoactive amines. Now, this granules they can now due to the contraction of the microtubules they can now travel to and go and fuse with the membrane and once they fuse with the membrane there is exocytosis. So, now there is exocytosis and release of this granules into the extracellular space leading to release of histamine or other vasoactive amines and this process this entire process is known as the degranulation. There is one more thing happening. So, on the sir on the, on this uh, this plasma membrane this plasma membrane uh, usually it is uh, a lipid bilayer and it has the phosphatidyl serine. So, which is uh, uh, lipid. So, lipid molecule in uh, present in the uh, lipid bilayer and there is conversion of this phosphatidyl serine to phosphatidyl choline. So, due to this uh, receptor cross linking cross linking of this F C receptor the F C high affinity receptor another uh, event occurs is conversion of the phosphatidyl serine to phosphatidyl choline and that leads to an increased fluidity of the membrane. So, now the membrane fluidity uh, starts to increase and now it opens up channels or pores for more calcium entry. So, there is more entry of calcium. So, the calcium channels and the calcium pores they open up more and there is more calcium entry into the cell and that also assists this process of microtubule contraction and that pulls the uh, these uh, granules or these uh, sacs containing the uh, histamine and allows it to go and fuse with the plasma membrane. Now, once they fuse with the plasma membrane that leads to exocytosis of this and that so, it basically delivers this uh, histamines the, the materials it carries it just delivers it outside the cell extracellularly and that leads to the degranulation of the mast cell. So, this entire process this entire process is known as mast cell degranulation. of the mast cells this also occurs with the mast cells and the basophils both. So, and this is how these vasoactive amines they come out of these mast cells leading to 
the all these manifestations or the inflammations increasing the inflammations leading to vasodilation and smooth muscle contraction and once there is vasodilation there is more uh, uh, immune cells more of these leukocytes migrating into the site of the action and enhancing this whole process. So, this is uh, the very um, uh, summary of the type 1 the mechanism of the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction how it occurs and the, the main thing we need to understand is that the type 1 hypersensitivity is an IgE mediated process that is an immunoglobulin E mediated process and it starts with the Th2 uh, cells uh, which are able to prime with the B cells and leading to the class switching of the antibodies and that leads to the formation of this IgE. Now, this IgE which or the allergen specific they can bind to the corresponding allergens and now this allergen which binds to this IgE can cross link the FC receptors the high affinity receptors present on the surface of the mast cells the basophils leading to degranulation and this degranulation process leads to release of excess amount of histamine leukotrienes prostaglandins and all these vasoactive amines and that leads to the subsequent process of inflammation or enhancement of inflammation. So, this is kind of the type 1 hypersensitivity and the type 1 hypersensitivity can usually be elicited by a wide variety of allergens like the pollens uh, like dust it is actually not dust is actually not dust it uh, basically contains um, some proteases like derpy for example. So, these proteases are actually the uh, responsible for eliciting the hypersensitivity reaction this protease is the allergen actually it is not the dust dust does not mean anything dust is not just dust. So, uh, th those people we, we very often say that I have dust allergy uh, we often say I have allergy to pollens. So, people who has allergy to pollens they has to be very careful during the month of the spring when uh, there are a lot of pollens in the air and that can cause this kind of type 1 hypersensitivity and leading to allergic rhinitis and many other manifestations in those people. So, this is the type 1 hypersensitivity we try to understand and then there we can uh, uh, then there is a second type of hypersensitivity we call it the type 2 hypersensitivity as I told it is mostly mediated by uh, the type 2 hypersensitivity. So, the the type 2 hypersensitivity as I told is mostly an IgG mediated immunoglobulin G mediated hypersensitivity. So, antibodies uh, which are produced against the cell surface antigens they mediate uh, the cell destruction. So, this cell destruction can be uh, many types. So, one of the very commonest type is the antibody dependent uh, cell mediated cytotoxicity we also call it ADCC that is antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. So, it is a cell uh, there is a specialized cell which can kill the target cell. So, it, but it is directed or governed by the antibodies and there can also be complement activation of course. So, there can also be co activation of the complements. So, basically when there is a target cell for example, when there is a target cell and there are receptors on the surface that binds to this IgG if this is the target cell then that can either lead to uh, recognition of these uh, receptors. So, they binds to so this so if these cells they have on their surface for example, um, uh, they have on their surface the uh, antibody receptors like the FC receptors for example, uh, they can bind to these antibodies and uh, these antibodies actually can bind to the target and that can lead to ADCC. So, uh, antibody dependent uh, cell mediated cytotoxicity or can also lead to activation of complements. So, complement activation 
activation or ADCC. So, these are the two major uh, ways it can mediate the type, it can mediate the type 2 uh, hypersensitivity. Now, type 2 hypersensitivity is a very common hypersensitivity uh, in particularly in case of blood transfusion. For example, uh, when there is this, uh, uh, we have this A, B, O, A, B blood groups and of course, we have uh, also this Rh antigens. So, the Rh negative or it can be blood groups can be Rh negative or Rh positive. So, if somebody who is Rh negative receives an Rh positive blood for example, then he or she will start to develop antibodies against the Rh antigen and that can lead to a type 2 uh, hypersensitivity. So, this IgG uh, can lead to a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction and this is a very, very common case particularly uh, in case of uh, women during uh, delivery um, of um, uh, fetus. So, if a woman, if the mother for example, she has Rh negative blood group. So, she is Rh minus and the fetus somehow has Rh positive. So, that means, now if by any chance that fetal blood enters into the mother's blood that will elicit an immune response very clear. So, that will clearly start to elicit an immune response and immediately that, uh, that will activate the B cells and the B cells will these Rh specific B cells they will now uh, start to produce either the plasma cells, the plasma cells which will produce the uh, immunoglobulin against the Rh antigen and will clear up the cells or the most dangerous part is that they can start develop the memory against it. So, if it keeps in the memory, so it will remember, so it will remind it, so it will remember and it can be deleterious, it can have deleterious effects if the mother conceives for a second time. That means, if the mother has a second pregnancy, in the first pregnancy it is not a problem because the mother's blood and the fetal blood is very well separated. There is very little uh, mixing between the two blood. So, it, it, the, the, the fetal blood hardly mixes with the mother's blood. So, there is hardly any mixing of the fetal blood with the mother's blood. So, there would not be any uh, response during that delivery, during that pregnancy. But during the, uh, during the delivery, you have to uh, there is a mixing of the blood. So, now there is mixing of the fetal blood with the mother's blood and a lot of fetal blood can enter into the mother's circulation and that can lead to a, a global response and that can lead to a humoral response in the mother. So, now if this Rh positive antigens enters into the mother's circulation that will uh, start developing the uh, so, the mother will start developing the antibodies. So, the antibodies will immediately come and neutralize and will clear uh, those cells, the fetal cells for uh, uh, RBCs, but it will generate memory and this memory is dangerous because now if the mother wants to conceive for a second time or she has a second delivery, then the memory will still be there and that can be, that can have very dangerous deleterious effect on the next uh, pregnancy or on the fetus. Anyway, we will uh, keep discussing uh, on this uh, topic on the type 2 and also we will uh, learn about type 3 and type 4 hypersensitivity a little bit in our next lecture. So, this is all for today's lecture. Thank you.